Can you imagine a law enforcement officer in this country trying to do his or her job without carrying a firearm? Officers being armed with handguns and other weapons is overwhelmingly taken for granted today. But it wasn't always that way. In this first of our three-part series on police pistol craft, we're going to take a look back at the law enforcement handgun, where we came from to get to where we are today. The source for this series is the textbook, Police Pistol Craft, the reality-based new paradigm of police firearms training. The author of the book is Mike Conti, former director of the Massachusetts State Police Firearms Training Unit and founder and director of the Sabre Group, which offers law enforcement training and consulting services. Conti will serve as our subject matter expert throughout this series. After watching this video, you will be able to describe why the handgun was initially adopted for use by law enforcement in the United States, describe how the handgun was initially employed by law enforcement, describe the types of handguns initially provided to law enforcement officers, and describe the development of police combat handgun training in the United States that eventually led to the old paradigm of police firearms training. Be sure to read the printed courseware that accompanies this video for more training information. There was virtually no law enforcement as we know it today in the original 13 colonies. The city of Boston established the night watch in the 1600s but officers served part-time and without pay. Boston also hired the first full-time paid law enforcement officers in the 13 colonies in 1712. But by and large, local customs served the populace well. And when the populace decided to break free of some customs and mores, they had an occupying army of British troops on hand to attempt to restore order. Of course, the citizenry would rise up and cast off their British occupiers but it would be a long and bloody conflict. When it was finally over, many citizens were uncomfortable with the idea of an armed force in their midst under the control of any type of government. What law enforcement there was was loosely organized and officially unarmed for the next 70 years. The first traces of organized municipal law enforcement don't emerge until the mid 19th century and they are based on the principles established by Britain's Sir Robert Peel, commonly recognized as the father of modern policing. Sir Bobby Peel was, uh, he's considered the father of modern policing. And uh, in the 1800s, he instituted the first organized municipal police department in England. Now, that's why they're still called Bobbies to this day. They named, they named them in honor of Bobby Peel, Robert Peel. Peel's nine principles of policing state that police should use physical force to the extent necessary to secure observance of the law or to restore order only when the exercise of persuasion, advice, and warning is found to be insufficient, and that police should use only the minimum degree of physical force that is necessary on any particular occasion for achieving a police objective. Law enforcement in the United States adopted Peel's principles and they still apply today. For the British, that meant not carrying firearms, but in America, that proved to be another matter. We did not arm our police officers at first either, but this was a different country, you know, a much bigger country. We, have, uh, we had a great influx of, of immigrants from all over the world. Uh, we had the Wild West still. We had all kinds of things going on. It was still a great untamed nation, as opposed to Britain, which had been civilized, you know, for thousands of years, basically. The vast American landscape was still largely unsettled and populated by a diverse population, most of whom had easy access to firearms and other weapons. Police officers in large cities and communities were not officially authorized to carry firearms, though many did as a matter of personal preference. We did not carry firearms. Now it wasn't, we did not carry, let me rephrase that, we did not carry firearms officially, okay? A lot of the police in this country carried pistols uh, and with the tacit uh, or, or an understanding from the authorities, the people running the departments that they were carrying, but they were never authorized or issued firearms to carry. It was kind of like a wink and a nod. They knew they carried them sometimes, but they weren't approved. The public still did not want to see an armed police presence, so whatever firearm the officers carried 
had to be kept out of sight. A single-shot flintlock was one of the small handguns that filled the bill. Its small size allowed the officer to keep it out of sight until it was needed. These pocket pistols were also much easier for the officer to carry on his beat than a shotgun or rifle. The flintlock eventually gave way to the percussion revolver, which in 1857 became the first officially issued law enforcement handgun. This was the first sidearm issued to police departments in the United States of America. Baltimore PD adopted this gun in 1857. This is the 1849 pocket revolver. It was called the pocket revolver because of its small size. It was designed uh, for easy concealment and easy carry, easy accessibility. Officers would actually carry this gun in their pocket on duty. It was prior to them adopting holsters and uh, various types of carry gear. So they would take the gun after it was loaded, which was quite a process in and of itself, and then they would simply slip the gun into a pocket. They would, might have a different type of a holster in the pocket or sometimes some type of cardboard uh, to, to hold the gun. Uh, many times they would also slip the gun inside a jacket or have a pocket done inside the jacket so they could keep the gun concealed. Again, these guns were designed or were adopted to be carried in a concealed manner. By far the most popular handgun of the day was the 1851 Colt Navy Revolver. This is a firing reproduction black powder version. Um, it is a cap and ball revolver, which means that it fires lead balls, in this case 36 caliber lead balls, and in order to fire this gun, to load it and fire it, you have to actually hand load each charge individually. So it was kind of an interesting process, just like we talked about with the 1849 pocket revolver. All of the percussion pistols that use percussion caps operated in a similar manner. The first law enforcement officer killed in the line of duty in the newly formed United States was New York City Deputy Sheriff Isaac Smith, shot and killed trying to make an arrest on May 17, 1792. That was 65 years before the Baltimore Police Department became the first to issue handguns to its officers. We're going to bring the weapon to half cock. Now, half cock position allows the cylinder to move freely. This was done for two reasons. One was it lubricates the ball as it goes down the barrel. Second thing is you want to kind of seal the ball in there with the grease to prevent the spark from jumping from one cylinder to the other cylinder when you fire the gun, just, just to prevent that from happening and causing another cylinder to, dis to discharge when it wasn't in alignment with the barrel. It was not uncommon for people equipped with these types of pistols to carry an extra cylinder in their pocket that was already loaded up and charged up so they could do uh, perform a quicker reload. That was their version of a speed loader at the time.
advent of the Civil War, the production of single action revolvers, or revolvers themselves, uh, percussion type, actually changed the whole way we use guns in this country, as far as law enforcement goes. The American Civil War would bring about the emergence of the handgun as a respected, deadly, offensive weapon in its own right. The handgun prior to the 1800s in the uh, creation of the revolver, the percussion revolvers, the handgun basically was a weapon of last resort just ahead of the edge weapon. Uh, usually they would use a long gun or a shotgun uh, for enforcement type applications. During the Civil War, the handgun came into its own. Uh, a new form of pistol fighting was developed during the Civil War. As the war ground on, each side saw the rise of horse-mounted guerrilla irregulars, such as the Union's Jayhawkers and the Confederate Bushwhackers. They developed a lightning-fast, close-quarter style of mounted combat that made the pistol an ideal weapon. When the war ended, that style of close-quarter pistol fighting made its way west. Uh, this was the Jesse James era, the Wild Bill Hickok era, uh, and these people who came out of that war learned how to fight with handguns because now they had repeating handguns. So they could fire them quickly, they could fire more rounds, and they got very, very accurate and effective with the handguns. So the Western Pistolero mythology, if you will, started to develop after the Civil War when a lot of these people who had these experiences started to migrate to the West, to the frontier that was quickly diminishing. And they were looking for you know, fame, fortune, wealth, adventure, whatever. So a lot of them ended up uh, gravitating to law enforcement. A lot of them were, were efficient gunmen, and gunmen didn't have a negative connotation at the time like it does now. At the time, a gunman was someone who was good with the gun. And uh, a lot of them fell into law enforcement or were drafted into it or chose it as an occupation because it was available. Wild Bill Hickok uh, gravitated into law enforcement. Wild Bill Hickok, another Western gunman, would have a profound effect on what would become the mythology of the American Pistolero. That mythology was built and enhanced by articles and magazines like Harper's New Monthly and numerous dime novels recounting the exploits on the Western frontier. Featured prominently and quite often fictitiously was the Western gunman, pistol slung low on the hip with a lightning fast draw and amazing accuracy. Ironically, only one of Hickok's gunfights even remotely resembled the high noon showdown of Western lore. Gunsmoke, starring James Arness as Matt Dillon. The rest were all strikingly similar to police gunfights of today. The basic dynamics haven't changed since the mid-19th century. All of his other gunfights that are recorded, they all occurred pretty much in the hours of darkness or in low-lit environments. Okay? So it's usually low-lit environment. They were all very close quarters as far as distance goes. Um, they were over very quickly. Usually there's only a few rounds fired, fast and furious. You still know the names of many of these men who became the law of the West, their legends becoming bigger than life. Wild Bill Hickok, Judge Roy Bean, Luke Short, Charlie Bassett, Fat Masterson, and Wyatt Earp. The pistol had become an American law enforcement staple, and the handgun would continue to evolve through the years. With the advent of the self-contained cartridge, a new generation of weapons was designed and produced. Here we have two of these. This is the Colt Police Positive, and we have the Smith & Wesson M&P Military and Police Model 38. This weapon was one of the most widely produced uh, firearms, millions of these guns were made. They were carried for decades by American law enforcement. This is the six inch barreled version. This was typically carried in this country by state police and highway patrol officers. Uh, this type of gun was carried by my department, the Mass State Police, for many years. Uh, typical municipalities, local law enforcement officers, uh, cities and towns, they usually carried the four inch version, a little bit shorter version. The 1970s saw an increase in police firepower with the introduction of the 357 Magnum round and guns to accommodate them, like the Model 65 stainless revolver and the Model 19. This time period also saw the introduction of the speed loader for revolvers. 
Oh, this is a this is truly a banner day in the history of the uh, FBI. July 13th, uh, 1990, the very first class of new agents fired the very first rounds with the 10 millimeter downrange today. The late 80s and early 90s brought the Wonder Nine era, the industry-wide adoption of the semi-automatic pistol in either 9 millimeter, 10 millimeter, or 40 caliber. Some at the time referred to them as all-day shooters, claiming you could load one in the morning and shoot all day long. The semi-auto pistol has been adopted almost universally by law enforcement today, but its design isn't all that new. This is the Colt 1911, a 45 caliber semi-automatic designed by John Browning and first sold by Colt Firearms almost 100 years ago. From April of 1878 to April of 1881, notorious outlaw Billy the Kid kills six law enforcement officers in New Mexico. When the Kid is killed by Pat Garrett in July of 1881, the Kid is said to have killed 21 men, one for every year of his life. He was issued the uniform, badge, gave him the gun in the holster, and he said, go get him, kid. That was all the training he got. Prior to and up through the American Revolutionary War, the predominant firearm was the musket, or long rifle. It was a hunting tool, a tool of survival, and the tool of the revolution. There was virtually no training provided in its use because it was assumed you knew how to use it. When the early flintlock pistols were developed, again, Use implied ability, so no training was needed. In the earliest years of American law enforcement, there was no handgun training because officers didn't carry handguns, at least not officially. It wasn't until the horse-mounted irregulars of the Civil War made the percussion revolver their weapon of choice that the handgun gained any kind of notoriety at all. The pistol took on a life of its own with the glory days of the Wild West, when the pistol-toting gunman with the lightning-fast draw thrilled readers of dime novels the world over. Still, the men who made the handgun famous didn't have any formal training. They were self-taught. Even when the Baltimore Police Department issued its officers the 31 caliber Colt pocket pistol in 1857, it didn't give any training in its use. At the time when guns were first issued, they were just issued, same kind of thing, go get them, kid. Okay? And we think that that's outrageous now, but this was just happening a few decades ago. A lot of people look at a handgun unfortunately, and they think, you load it, fire it, that's all you need to know, what else is there to know? That was an attitude that continued in this country for decades, until 1895, when a revolutionary thinker named Teddy Roosevelt became a commissioner of the New York City Police Department. Roosevelt notices at the time, he takes note that there are a lot of his officers are involved in situations with their guns where they're shooting themselves, they're having unintentional discharges, negligent discharges, um, their gunfight, uh, when they get into gunfights, their performance was abysmal. And Roosevelt looks at it and sees that there's absolutely no training going on. So Roosevelt decides to institute the first formalized police firearms training in 1895. Because when you look at it, in essence, what it actually was, all he had them do was they fired some familiarization rounds, very few rounds. They did a lot of dry firing. He, uh, he had them work with the guns a little bit but they did next to nothing with the guns, right? But when you look at it, from where they were to where he took them, it was a huge stride. You know, even we look at it nowadays, we see it's, it's not even minimal, it's below minimal need. Um, but it was a huge stride because he broke that, that mold. He started to recognize, he recognized that there was some type of training needed for the firearms. It would be a mistake to think that once a handgun training need was identified within the New York City Police Department, other departments would immediately follow suit. Within a couple of decades, more and more 
people, more and more departments started to look at this. But again, most departments for, for decades, uh, very, very little, if any, police firearms training. Teddy Roosevelt was once again leading the charge, not up San Juan Hill, but as the vanguard of police firearms training. Unfortunately, that training ideal came to a crossroads and made what Mike Conti considers a wrong turn. They have adopted firearms now. They are issuing them to the police. Now they've decided that they need to give them some type of training with these firearms. So what do you do? Now here we are, we're standing at this crossroads and we have two choices. We can take the easy route and we can borrow from something that's already built. Or we could take the other road, which would have been the correct road, and we could have had a program built for the police, by the police from within. Could have looked at the mission, could have looked at the equipment, looked at the people and the environments they work in, and we could have built something for them. But they didn't do that. military has guns. They've been using weapons for a long time. They've got training programs. We'll borrow theirs. The adoption of the established military training and qualification courses would eliminate the need for the members of the civilian police forces to research and create their own training. Unfortunately, what was either overlooked or intentionally ignored was the fact that the training programs had been developed expressly for military training and qualification purposes not civilian law enforcement purposes. Even though it provided a means for training large numbers of police officers in mechanical technique, it did not address the specific mission and environment that police officers would be tasked to deal with. The military mission is different from the civilian police mission. Always has been, always will be, even though the two are starting to converge a little bit with the way our troops are being required to operate overseas and and the way the police are operating a lot of times now in this country. So there is a blending, but at the time, it was pure civilian police firearms training that they could have done, but they brought in the military model. Virtually all firearms training at the time became target-oriented, the object being to put bullets on targets from varying distances. Officers stand with, you know, bladed side to the uh, target, pistol extended in one hand, their other hand in their pocket or on the hip. If you look at this, it's almost very similar to uh, old dueling stances. Law enforcement had already experienced its Wild West influence, and the next major influence on firearms training would come from the Wild Wild East. It's the 1920s and 30s in Shanghai, China, often described as the toughest city in the world. Two British police officers with the Shanghai Municipal Police Department studied the shootings the police there were involved in. The now legendary William Fairbairn and Eric Sykes took what they learned and not only changed the firearms training of their department, but they wrote a book called Shooting to Live. What they did is they watched their people as they were involved in gunfights. Again, hundreds of gunfights in Shanghai. You talk about the wild, wild west, this was the wild, wild east, okay? They put the wild west to shame. So it was filled with gunmen, filled with flying lead, in the years that they were there, they watched and they learned. And they saw that when their people engaged a human threat, usually at close quarters, they did certain things instinctively. Okay? And again, if you look at it, there's 13,000 years of evolution here that has programmed us to do different things. If you're facing a threat, what the human being typically does is we crouch. If it's an immediate threat, we crouch. Our eyeballs both slam open wide because we want to take in as much information as possible about this threat so we can deal with it appropriately. Or decide to run, okay? So it's fight or flight type thing kicking in. Fairbairn and Sykes developed what became known as the point shooting system, which Fairbairn is shown here 
teaching in then top secret OSS training during World War II. Fairburn had used they call it the three quarter hip position, which is the gun is held below line of sight. That was Fairburn's thing. That's how he, he did it. Fairburn and Sykes developed this system. Uh, they called it the point shooting system. And as it evolved, there were different stylizations, but again, all based on natural responses to an immediate threat. And they had great, great success with their people in the field going up against constant human threats. Great success with this. High hit rates, high survivability rates for their people. And uh, they overcame many, many threats. Fairbairn has developed a mystery shoot program in Shanghai that was duplicated by the military and adopted as a house of horrors. The house of horrors was set up in a basement and designed to simulate experiences the students would most likely be encountering in the field. It was during his time conducting training at what is now Camp David that Fairbairn encountered a man destined to also become a combat legend, Colonel Rex Applegate. He meets Fairbairn. Fairburn shows him the system that they had developed in Shanghai, the point shooting system. Now, Fairburn had used, they call it the three quarter hip position, which is the gun is held below line of sight. That was Fairburn's thing. That's how he, he did it. Applegate worked with them, and eventually, the Applegate system, if you will, point shooting system, it had the weapon lifted to eye level. He brought it up to eye level instead of down below eye level, okay? And, and these are subtle distinctions, but they're important. So he brings it up to eye level, and this became the point shooting system uh, that we know today and that a lot of us are employed. Where law enforcement began by adopting military-style firearms training, the military was now adopting a system developed by law enforcement, which was then copied again by law enforcement. It became known as the Applegate Combat Shooting Method. To learn and apply the core elements of the Applegate combat shooting method, first acquire a visual on the threat. Crouch and bring the body square. From this crouched and squared position, the weapon is presented with one hand in a ready position that is identified as muzzle depressed, 45 degrees. From the center of your body, extend your arm and lock the wrist and the elbow to control the stability of the weapon. The shoulder is used as the pivot point for the vertical lift of the weapon to eye level. The lift stops when the weapon interrupts the line of sight to the threat. Multiple shots are recommended. But the evolution of pistol training has not been in a straight line. Being startled from the side does not change the technique. There have been many twists and turns along the way that put more emphasis on putting holes in paper targets than in keeping the officers on the street alive. Hear a loud boom, see a flash right in front of me. And again, we went off that track and we began to focus on training. Training became an activity unto itself. We began to train our police officers to succeed in training, not in the field. To unload, turn over. Press the magazine release catch with thumb of left hand, drawing the magazine out into the palm. In part two of our pistol craft series, we'll continue to follow the evolution of pistol training through the ages and begin to untangle the twisted web that it has become. Stick your head up, head down. The basic text for this series is the book, Police Pistol Craft, the reality-based new paradigm of police firearms training, available from Sabre Press.